Once this trip was underway, David and John Box packed their bags for a 10,000 mile location scouting expedition. Finding locations proved especially difficult, because as you can see from the sketches John Box drew before production began, Chivago covers so many places, so many years, and all the seasons. You can't create a landscape, you've got to find it and make it work. There are certain basic principles about Dr. Zhivago. It is set in Russia. That's a big country. The scale is critical for telling this very particular story. And then there's the practical issue. You've got to have locomotives, steam locomotives. You've got to have a lot of horses. You're going to need a lot of fine riders. And it's a film, because Russia's a big place, there's a lot of people there. You need big crowds. Replacements. Well, we started in Yugoslavia, had a film business, had studios, had steam locomotives. It did not feel right. And this word feel is very important because it's atmosphere. It's not just sets or location. You've got to create a, a world in which actors play out those parts. And you've got to help the actors. It does help them if you get it right. We next moved north, Finland and Sweden, obviously for winter and for snow. And they didn't have the studios, this, that and the other that we would require because we were a big movie. So back I come to David and tell him it won't work. This question, John, where are we going to make this film? And I looked him straight in the eyeball and said, Spain. Spain offered studio facilities within easy reach of landscapes that Javago would need. It has the size, it has the scale we require, it has the locomotive. It has extras, it has sophisticated construction and technical people there. And it would look excellent on the screen. And Moscow rose anew outside Madrid. It was here, on this 10-acre site in the small Madrid suburb called Canillas, that John Box recreated Zhivago's Moscow. It took 18 months and 800 workers to construct the giant set. The Kremlin dominated streets that even featured two working trolley lines. The architecture and even the window dressing were all painstakingly researched and recreated. It was incredible, because the two streets, there was the big street, the beautiful street, and then there were the, the poor street where Lara lived, and there were two streets that were parallel. And all the houses, you know how mostly film sets, they're just, you, you look behind them and there are bits of sticks coming out. All the houses were real houses. All the interiors of our house, the Gromyko house, were shot on that set. With a horse-drawn sleigh, the bygone Moscow of the early 1900s makes a striking setting for photographers and journalists from all corners of the world who come to photograph and interview Geraldine Chaplin. For the scenes in the countryside, the production moved 150 miles north of Madrid to Soria. Here's Julie sunning herself while we wait to shoot the wagon caravan scene. It was unbelievable. So you'd be outside on this plain in Soria. So hot, I can't tell you. Not a tree, nothing, except the false trees, which were for the, for the film. Soria was also where Dr. Zhivago's most recognizable set was built. The hauntingly beautiful Ice Palace. The amazing thing in that picture to me is the ice palace, which is made out of beeswax. I mean, John Box, the designer, was incredible on that picture. Highly emotional. These two key characters come back there, and they go in. 
what are they going to find in there? I didn't know, really know how to handle it, but then I suddenly saw some reference of Scott's last days in the Antarctic in the room, and it showed quite a small hole, and the wind had blown the snow and ice through it, and the snow and ice had made strange shapes, and that gave me my clue. Take the set. It's going to be a bit unreal, but it's going to be real at the same time. Ice it up. And I go to Eddie Fowley, prop special effects and everything. We just did it very simply. We had very hot white wax. Eddie went round with a bucket and a big mug, and he threw it all over the architecture, the furniture, and everything else. When I thought it looked right, I hit it with nearly freezing water with a, with a pump. So it just froze. And you dabbed a bit of mica on the later and that sort of thing. Um, seemed to work. It had an effect on the actors. We needed to shoot in that particular place, the Four Seasons. So we had to shoot scenes where it was winter all snowed up. We had some spring scenes, so we had the people, the special effects had, had to put leaves on the trees and paint them green and put flowers. And then we had the autumn and then they, up they went to paint the leaves in the autumn colors. So it was all done by hand, literally. One morning we'd come in and it would be spring. I don't know how, they'd like fairies. And next day, because we were doing all the stuff that was shot there at one, at one go. Next day we'd come in, it'd be autumn. They'd sprayed the trees, pulled up the plants. Next day it would be winter. Snow on the ground, icicles hanging. <laughs> and there were scenes shot up there when the temperature was over 100 Fahrenheit, which were snow scenes. But there was awful problems with the landscape at the back. We had to roll out miles of white plastic and cover it with white marble dust. And we had to pay attention to the details of frosting up close shots. The music of Rivago got the production in trouble one night when General Franco's repressive and arch-conservative police heard the extras singing the Internationale, the communist anthem. <laughs> That was an extraordinary night. We were shooting at night. These thousands of extras had to sing the Internationale, which is the, the Marxist hymn. They all knew it. This is just after the, well, it's not just after the Civil War, but they all, they certainly all knew it. And again, Spain was in this incredibly repressive regime, General Franco, etc. And they were singing with such gusto, marching down and singing as loud as they could. Everyone knew the words. And the police came. The police came with, with uh, I mean, really, they thought something very dangerous was happening. And uh, so the, the first assistant had to, to explain, no, 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 this is a movie and it's about uh, uh, Russia and it's, uh, and, but the police then they hung around because they wanted to see who knew that song really well. And so we had to get rid of the police. But apparently all the neighbors in Canillejas, which was the small village where we were shooting, they suddenly in the middle of the night, because it was about three in the morning we did this thing, they woke up and they heard the Internacional. They got out their bottles, popping up in their bottles. They thought, God, he's dead, Franco's there, or whatever. No doubt they'll sing in June after the revolution. 